quick introduction and kind of get get started. Um, my name is Simone Corsi and I work uh, on the boards in Seattle. Um, I'm on the board's TV and digital media manager there. Hi, my name is Adam Neil Kay. I am the Hellbound Fellow. I work with Hellbound. Hi, I'm Ruth Whistler Looper. I run Boom Arts in Portland, Oregon. Uh, my name is Jorge Vargas and I'm co artistic director of Teatro Lina de Sombra from Mexico. I'm Adam Sarge, I'm an archivist and video artist uh, based in Los Angeles. Okay. Um, we're going to get started kind of along this line and just kind of go down with some information for you and we'll um, then have a Q&A kind of period at the end. Um, so on the board's TV, um, I'm going to play a little video for you that kind of gives you a sense of what it is. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. On the Boards TV creates a new way to experience contemporary performance, capturing the intensity and spectacle of internationally acclaimed artists and bringing their work to the digital arena. Prepare to be pulled into the theater experience through gorgeous HD video, multiple camera angles, and clarity of sound. Built in theaters across the U.S., on the Boards TV showcases full-length, affordable performance films that you missed, that you loved, and that you can share with family and friends. <coughs> Accessible to audiences around the globe through tablets, laptops, computers, or home TV systems. On the Boards TV, making contemporary performance affordable and accessible to everyone. TV, kind of what you just saw. Uh, we launched On Boards TV in 2010, and it is an on-demand website for contemporary performing arts um, films that we have filmed um, uh, in Seattle at On the Boards in Portland uh, as part of the Portland Institute of Contemporary Arts uh, Time-Based Arts Festival uh, in New York with PS122 and um, in Austin with the Fusebox Festival. Uh, so we have 51 dance and theater films, um, multidisciplinary films. Um, by 47 artists from around the globe. Um, and then we have audiences in all 50 states, uh, 52 countries, and right now um, 99 academic institutions, which is one of our biggest growing ad, um, audiences. Um, so some of the initial goals, I'll just kind of read through them. Um, break down the barriers of geography, time, and cost for arts participation. Um, it's $5 to uh, rent a performance film for 48 hours, so similar to going to a um, video store and just grabbing a video for a short period of time, um, up to a $50 one-year streaming subscription where you have access to the entire catalog. Um, create an opportunity for audiences to develop relationships with the performing art artists and become art fans with um, performances that they might not see otherwise. Uh, establish a new standard for performance documentation. Uh, provide a new revenue stream for artists. We split 50-50 um, of each sale with the artist uh, for each purchase of their performance. Um, we want to create a, mo a new model for the field in terms of um, distribution, filming, and uh, documentation. Uh, provide content for academic institutions to teach current contemporary performance practices. Um, and that sixth one is, was a newer goal that once we launched, we had realized, um, the, quickly realized the value of these, this catalog to academic institutions um, where current contemporary performance art was not available to them otherwise. Um, so kind of how does it work? I'll <coughs> kind of work around it, but if I have, if you have questions, feel free to stop me. Um, so we work with a professional film crew, and we either uh, film in Seattle or we fly uh, with a director and a sound engineer to our various location, 
and um, work with a local crew there and uh, work with the artists to set up a filming plan, uh, figure out the best way that their performance should be captured. Um, it's you know better if we can see the film before or we see like the opening night, then we'll film maybe the next night of the performance. Um, uh, we do a couple rounds of edits with the artist, but the artist is the primary editor for the film. Um, and it's important to us that it represents as close to as possible the live representation of how it happened. Um, and then we distribute it online via our website. So this is an example of one of our performance pages. Um, so you can stream, download there, and then kind of below you'll see uh, there's an about section where we try to help contextualize what the performance was like. Um, uh, we have, you know, just like reviews and that sort of thing. Um, and it, it is accessible uh, via mobile devices as well. Uh, just here's a quick list of some of the artists. Um, we have Tetel and Anna in the room as well right now. Um, uh, so yeah, like I said, we have artists from around the globe, which is pretty great. Um, as well as a, a big chunk of these are from the Pacific Northwest Seattle-based artists. Um, so, kind of why is it important? So, like I said, uh, access to artists and performances, some of which will never be performed again. Um, there's pieces that just won't tour anymore that we have, have been able to film. Um, it's an opportunity for artists to, to tour more widely and be seen internationally. We've had some artists who, um, who presenters have seen the pieces uh, on On The Boards TV and then were able to get in contact with the artist and because of the quality of the work sample essentially, um, they were able, they wanted to then bring <coughs> that performance to the, to the venue. Um, <coughs> uh, academic value, I spoke a little bit about this already, but we do have um, 99 uh, educational institutions in the UK, Europe, uh, Canada, and Australia. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but uh, what's pretty awesome is that they've been starting, started to um, pull in some of our material and uh, into just like their classrooms and on a daily basis we'll, we'll see, be able to see what they're watching, um, how they're incorporating the films into their work, just teaching about current contemporary practices. Um, this is a new revenue stream for artists, like I said. Um, the cost can be as low as $5. Uh, sorry, I keep touching the screen. It's hard without them. Um, we have audiences in all 50 states. Um, we've done some research, and most of these are avid arts fans, um, intrigued brow browsers, uh, students and arts professionals, is what our research tells us. Um, so most people who are coming to the website are interested in arts in general. Oh, and we also do screenings, which is um, actually something that we'll be doing. We'll be talking about more in a minute, and we'll be doing as part of this conference tomorrow. Um, so here's a little bit more about how to get involved with On The Boards TV as an educational institution. Um, there's a streaming subscription where it's uh, a one-year sort of academic uh, subscription. And what's great about this is that basically within campus, you know, we set up technology-wise so that within campus internet ranges, you're automatically subscribed. So any student can just hop on and just go to onthebornz.tv within campus internet um, and in, have instant access to the films, as well as at home, you just log in through your library system. So it becomes sort of like um, an e-journal like JSTOR or something like that that is an educational resource. Um, there's a $50 academic download of a single film for institutions who are uh, able to purchase the whole $500 subscription. Um, and one of our latest projects, this one of my favorite uh, right now, is we're working to further contextualize our performance films. Um, we're working with Claudia LaRocco and Michelle Ellsworth, um, both, both dance scholars and writers and artists as well. Um, and so we're working to, we're starting with a handful of performance films that we've already finished. Um, and we're working to build out contextual materials such as artist lineages, behind the scenes, um, maybe a director's cut where the artist talks about the process, um, just different things that might be helpful teaching these, these, about these artists. Um, so here's some examples of current class, classroom use. I won't read them all, but um, they've been used in performance <coughs> review and critique classes, you know, dance and theater history, just really teaching current trends in performance art, um, online courses. Uh, we've had some Dance 101 online courses incorporate our films into their um, classes. 
uh, faculty uses, just, you know, research, like faculty who are stuck in, in a rural area may not be able to go out and see these performances live, so. Um, so a quick list of our universities right now. And um, maybe I'll pass it to Ruth, we'll talk a little bit more about screenings, um, our education beyond the classroom. Uh, hi. <coughs> So I'm Ruth and I, I live in Portland, Oregon. I run a, um, a small nonprofit uh, presenting and producing organization that focuses on experimental ex aesthetics meeting um, community impact in the contemporary theater uh, for few, working with US and international artists. Um, and I was, uh, when Boom Arts was just starting out, this is us, um, on the boards uh, engaged Boom Arts to as a partner in producing uh, facilitated screenings in small communities in our region, so Pacific Northwest. Um, and that was in 2013 that we started it, and now we're in round two. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, those, that first round, and then also kind of what lessons we learned and, um, and what we're doing <coughs> at the moment. So um, we, for the 2013 round one, we basically worked only exclusively with um, Amarillo, which is the created by most of the people. <laughs> um, and uh, tomorrow morning, those who are attending the conference here will see the film. It's a beautiful um, theater piece about uh, about immigration issues writ large, but really about the kind of tragedy of the dangerous crossings that people make coming from Central America and Mexico, uh, venturing northward through the desert. Uh, so there's a lot about um, families left behind, about the, um, the, the effect of, de of dehydration on the body. There's many different layers that it operates at a, a sort of specific and also um, uh, metaphorical levels, symbol sim visual symbolism, movement. There's lots, lots in there, it's pretty cool. Um, so this piece is uniquely able to, to, is uniquely relevant and also able to speak to a really large range of publics and the, the um, Teatro Lina has toured, it, has toured it around the world um, to festivals and theaters, but um, through On the Boards TV, it was able to reach much smaller communities uh, that had art centers that weren't as, wouldn't necessarily have brought the touring show through, um, but yet had audiences that for whom it was very relevant. And that's kind of the, the sweet spot that we found with the, the Community Screenings Project was that, um, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, there are many smaller communities that have kind of a rift or a dis total disconnect between the kind of Anglo-Saxon um, residents and the Latino community, um, and then perhaps they have a large uh, agricultural um, agriculture at the center of the, the in the, you know, as a major industry in these small towns, um, but like absolutely no connection. And, and we also found that many in many of these towns, um, an art center would be only serving the Anglo-Saxon community and wishing that they could uh, have more contact, more meaningful contact with the Latino community, but not knowing how to do it. Um, so we did a number of these screenings where we would partner with a local art center um, and kind of help, part of what I did is sort of some on the ground um, community outreach work um, to uh, basically help them to, to use this event as a way of kind of bridging the divide. Um, and, and for that reason, these, these screenings were very impactful. Um, I want to show a little bit about yeah. the, this is the trailer of the Thank you. 
hacer caso llegas tarde one we did actually at the University of Oregon in Eugene, and you can see Jorge Skyping in, who's now here. Um, that was the first one. <laughs> 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 um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this, this one. Um, so this is the, just as a kind of example of the, the places that we went. So, so Yakima Valley, Washington is where Monique is from. And um, this little town um, is very much involved in the uh, apple um, industry. So there's many apple orchards, uh, apple picking, apple packing, um, and it's kind of one of the epicenters of, well, that, that region is, is, is a national center for apples. Um, and so um, one of these little towns in the valley, Titan, has basically has this very interesting culture where on the one hand, um, it's predominantly Latino, terms of who lives there, the language is spoken in the town center, etc. But there's also kind of this art world uh, aspect because there's a, a, a art book maker from Seattle who, who um, bought, bought quite a lot of property in the town and started to um, set up kind of artisanal, high-end artisan workshops in the town. And so basically they have this art world, it's kind of like Marfa Tech. So th there's a kind of art world presence, and then there's also this other. So, so our screening actually was very uh, a lovely kind of intersection of those two worlds, um, where the screening took place in a, a building that had been bought by this uh, as part of this kind of art complex. Uh, it was an old uh, Apple warehouse, and uh, um, they set up a taco truck outside, and I uh, had uh, a sonfarocho band perform mm -hmm. afterwards, which was amazing. And so it was kind of a, a, a lovely integration of, of those two worlds, which in this little tiny town sometimes feel a little distant. Um, yeah. And I think just to mention also one of the um, things we tried to do with these screenings, particularly with Amarillo, um, was to do a bilingual post-screening conversation that Ruth led and facilitated and moderated. Um, and that was really important to us because the idea was to also not just attract the white people in that particular area. Right. <coughs> um, yeah, so we had a 90, I have the statistics here, 90 attended. It was about 60 to 70 percent Spanish speaking. Um, and then, yeah, so, and then the, the speakers we had were uh, scholars and community members. Mm -hmm. Um, so then the next one I want to mention is um, in another small town that was all, that's also um, uh, that's also um, an agricultural center. So they, this is in Hood River, Oregon. They have um, cherries and pears primarily. Um, and so this was a, an art center um, called Columbia Center for the Arts hosted us. Um, Anecdotally, they were founded in a building which we learned later served as a holding center for detained Japanese Americans during World War II. It just happens to be the case. But anyway, this, this art center also had this feeling of we don't, no, zero connection to the Latino community, which is huge in, the, in that region. Like about, about half. No, no. And is it or yes. So it's about a third. So there's about a third um, of that community is, you know, of Latino heritage, whether it's Mexican or um, Anyway, this art center, which is located right in this sort of touristic downtown, had zero connection. And so for them, this event was um, important. Uh, and about 63 attended, and the vast majority were Latino who had never come to the center before. Um, and then the, the, this particular conversation we had with um, community health promoters um, who lived in the town and would um, tend to the needs of um, 
many, uh, include, many people, including the migrant families that come to pick uh, fruit seasonally. And we learned that there were about 10,000 families that come into the town every year for the two, two month uh, <coughs> harvest season. And uh, this organization helps provide services and help uh, health promotion there. Anyway, it was their comments were very interesting in terms of just educating the other people in the room about what kind of work they do, what are the realities and challenges that their community faces, etc. Um, and so that made the event have a community resonance that was above and beyond the piece. But certainly the piece, um, <clears throat> the function of the art work was to open up those spaces for curiosity and wanting to learn and compassion. Um, and then one last example from 2013 is a town called Plymouth Falls, Oregon. Um, this is a town that's 11% uh, Latino. And <coughs> this is a, a theater that it doesn't also has very little connection with the Latino community. Um, and the executive director kind of saw potential again for this event to catalyze, um, to bridge divides, and he was very excited about it. Um, this was an interesting experience because the community was actually quite conservative. So of all the different towns, it was probably the most um, conservative. And so that resulted, and also the Latino community would have the least level of organization and self um, and advocacy, I think. Um, so it was very hard to find uh, community leaders. Um, and uh, they were often working within uh, Anglo-Saxon run organizations, social service organization, so there wasn't very much kind of self-determination going on. Um, and uh, there was a lower turnout for the event, and then there also was um, some uh, Fox News style polemics that emerged during the um, conversation. So that was, that was an interesting window for us into kind of a more hostile environment. Um, and even though the, the artwork did speak to many people, it also kind of gave us a kind of picture of what people were up against in terms of racism and um, uh, invisible. Um, so the, just a couple of conclusions from, from, uh, from uh, that first phase was that um, it was amazing to see how this particular piece, which you'll see tomorrow, uh, spoke to a very non-traditional audience. Um, and that has to do with the piece itself and the artists, the amazing artists who created it. Um, so uh, it's that mix of you know the approach to the topic and then the topic that's very resonant, um, and and also it was magical to see that how on the boards TVs making this film possible allowed these much larger communities to see the film, the, the work, and they never would have seen it. They absolutely never would have. Um, and then uh, there's also uh, this the function of the film with the community screening, which is kind of, it's kind of like the community screenings project, I maybe you could say it's kind of like intentional uh, delivery of the service, right? Intentional, so it was kind of like through On the Words Community Screenings Project, we were able to find the ideal audience or the right, a new audience, a right audience for a work that has the potential to speak to a larger audience than just its traditional arts, contemporary art. And so, um, yeah, On the Words TV allowed us to to kind of seek out those audiences and, and offer this. Um, so then we have this round two, and um, some of the questions that were, what were brought up for round two were, um, what if we return to the same communities with a different performance film, is that possible? Uh, and what if we expanded the geographic imprint of the Community Screenings Project to include more regions of the US? Um, so we've now completed two of those five screenings, and we're planning, and then tomorrow is another one, and then we've got some more in Austin, Texas. Um, so the two that are interesting to note for the Pacific Northwest is we did um, go back to Plymouth Falls, this more conservative community, um, working with this executive director and saying, well, what other what other films in the in the um, archive are interesting to you? And this, of course, would have another service, a different kind of audience. And we found that the that the um, strength of the On the Boards archive for um, in more general terms, not just about this particular piece. Um, was the relationships that On the Boards has with local artists and civic artists. And so we found that the value that On the Boards was able to add with this kind of intentional screening was that On the Boards brought money, brought um, the choreographer to Lime Falls in person, and that um, she participated in the post show discussion. Yeah, and we did a master class with um, about 50 uh, dance 
dancers from the area ranging from age 11 to mid 50s, um, which is actually pretty great. And I think that um, the the kind of the art piece that was centered, it was centered around was the film, but actually the most impact that Zoe Schofield, the choreographer, had from this event was actually that master class and the, um, the idea of kind of going into this community. It definitely served a different purpose than the previous screening, but for her it was very impactful going into this community and um, really being able to talk with and access uh, people that she would never otherwise be able to get to talk to and be inspired by them as artists as well as like see their appreciation for her work um, where she works in an entirely different field so um, yeah so the value add it was bringing the artist mm -hmm. into the room um, mm -hmm. and so and the same thing is what we did in going back to Portland we uh, I had learned the lesson that in a smaller community a screening can be a big deal um, whereas in an urban setting it may be it's not doesn't get headlines or whatever as it did in Plentiful. Um, so we went to a smaller town um, and also were able to bring uh, Jorge and Alicia to the event itself. And so that, that made for this community, um, it made it quite a big deal. That was two event. days ago. And that was two days ago, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and so as we continue, <coughs> I'm just noticing that um, Nat, as we try to kind of expand this idea nationally, we rely also on relationships and kind of the value add that having the artist participate uh, brings to it. And so, uh, yeah. So I just want to ask uh, Jorge a couple of questions. So, um, Jorge, can, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about, um, we talked, we, we said about that on the Boys TV, this film can bring Amarillo um, to two audiences. Do you, can you talk yes. about how you've done that with the migrant? Okay. Uh, do you think it's possible to translate? Because I, I think I, I am more smart in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bueno, desde que estuvimos hace un par de días en, en Portland y estuvimos en este screening en Cornelius. Mm -hmm. So we were, they were in Portland for a couple of days this week and uh, we were part of the screening in Cornelius this morning. <coughs> y que estuvimos conversando un poco alrededor de esta, este evento, eh, pues he, hemos pensado un poco eh, cómo fue el origen del, del trabajo de Amarillo. Mm -hmm. When they were uh, having many conversations around the screening, they started thinking about what was the uh, work of making Amarillo. Porque cuando hicimos Amarillo, eh, lo hicimos porque pensábamos que era importante visibilizar el hecho de que había muchos migrantes que estaban eh, muriendo tratando de cruzar el desierto. When they made Amarillo, it was because they wanted to give visibility to the fact that many migrants were dying on the, through the, on the way through the desert on the way. Y que eso era causa de la construcción del, del muro entre México y Estados Unidos, con, eh, que era un muro de alta tecnología. And that's because there had been a, um, a wall built, a high technology wall between Mexico and Mexico. Hablando de tecnología. Y eh, entonces había una intencionalidad en amarillo de hacer visible una realidad y que tenía más o menos como una intencionalidad, llamémosle así, política. Mm -hmm. So amarillo had a kind of political intentionality to it um, that was related to this. Así es que también pensamos mucho en cuáles, quiénes eran nuestros destinatarios. Mm -hmm. So we thought a lot about who's it for. Y hasta que on the boards, hizo este extraordinario documento eh, de una de las funciones que hicimos en Seattle. So until On the Boards made this film, this beautiful film in Seattle. Eh, pudimos llegar a donde no habíamos podido llegar con la pieza. Mm -hmm. We tried to go to places with the piece. Eh, y eh, porque Amarillo comenzó a tener, eh, empezó a moverse en los circuitos nacionales, internacionales y festivales, pero era muy caro poder llevar amarillo a las comunidades. Mm -hmm. So for them it was, uh, uh, Amarillo was touring a lot to festivals and theaters, and nationally and internationally, but it was also very expensive to bring it to certain, to certain communities. Así es que eh, este proyecto nos permitió estar en comunidades que, eh, que nunca habíamos imaginado estar, o Quizá otra, otro punto importante es que eh, podíamos estar en las conversaciones o en, los, en las clases de ciertas universidades que estaban interesadas en el tema. 
So this, on the West, you'd be allowed the peace to reach communities that they never um, would have thought they would be able to reach within and also to be discussed in the classes pero, by students. Pero quisiera colocar aquí como una imagen eh, paradójica también. But I want to create a um, paradox, uh, bring up a paradox. ¿Por qué no fue sino hasta hace dos años que conseguimos los fondos para llevar amarillo a las zonas migrantes? Mm -hmm. So two years ago they were able to receive funds to bring amarillo um, to migrant uh, points along the migrant route in New Mexico. Así es que tenemos un proyecto que se llama eh, Amarillo en la Ruta Migrante. So they have a project called Amarillo and the Migrant Route. Y todo comienza en la Ciudad de México porque eh, rentamos un camión muy grande y llevamos todo, incluso lo necesario para montar un teatro. Uh, so they have a big van in Mexico City and they pack everything in including uh, the tools they need to actually build a theater. Pipes. <laughs> Wires, <laughs> everything, everything. <laughs> uh, chairs. <laughs> hasta la con so they went, they, they mm -hmm. yeah. sí, uh, So they went, they, they traveled down to the south uh, to the border of Así es que nuestra primera experiencia fue en a 50 kilómetros de la frontera de Guatemala. So that was their first stop was Tenosique, uh, 50 kilometers from the border of Guatemala. Y construimos un teatro para poder presentar a Marín. They built a theater just to be able to present a Marín. Ah, y al mismo tiempo, Amarillo ha sido el pretexto para poder tener una relación de trabajos de intervención social entre la comunidad y los albergues de migrantes. So uh, Amarillo becomes the pretext for a series of um, interventions but that's kind of, I don't know if that's not like that English word. Uh, so basically, um, uh, actions to kind of uh -huh. social, social justice. Social justice, <laughs> trying to connect the community with the uh, albergues. Um, uh, shelters. Yeah. Shelters. Shelters. Uh, migrants. Migrant shelters. Así es que nuestra tecnología es con pedidos a la mexicana con alambres, cables, y al final sucede el milagro de, de ver la obra de Marillo. So, like, they use the te te Mexican techniques of wires and... Um, okay. Okay. Ties. Sí, usamos. To, uh, to bring the, the play... Una forma de la tecnología de artesanal. Uh, an art artisanal technology. Mientras que eh, en, este, en estos eventos de los streams, También pienso que el documento es el pretexto para poder establecer una conexión con la comunidad. So he says that he feels the same way about these screenings that they are, that the film is a pretext for creating those relationships with the community. Así que cuando estuvimos en Cornelius, la película sirvió de pretexto para que la gente hablara y quería hablar mucho. So when we were in Cornelius, in Cornelius, um, the film uh, served as a pretext for the community to speak and in the the conversation we had after was, was just as rich as the film. <laughs> Solo hablamos un poco y después ellos hablaron. They talked for a little bit and then the people in the audience spoke a lot about their desires. Sobre sus deseos, sus problemas, sus, uh, sus ganas de regresar a México o no. Their wishes to go back to Mexico or not. Así es que de la misma manera que en la frontera de Guatemala sucede un fenómeno eh, hecho de manera artesanal De este lado, la tecnología está creando el mismo fenómeno eh, a 6,000 kilómetros de distancia. Mm -hmm. So, the same thing that's happening in, in, uh, on the border with Guatemala in the more uh, handmade way um, is happening 6,000 kilometers north and through on the worst. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hi. So, <laughs> Yes, I am. Hi, my name is Adam Lee. I work with HowlRound. Um, we're based in Boston, Massachusetts at Emerson College. Um, essentially, HowlRound is a knowledge commons by and for the theater community. So what is HowlRound, you might ask? Well, I have a video. <laughs> That's what is a HowlRound? You may be wondering, what is a HowlRound? What have I gotten myself into? Is it like a bunch of people standing in a circle pretending to be wolves? Because frankly, I want nothing to do with that. No. HowlRound is 
Are you ready for this? I am ready. HowlRound is a knowledge commons by and for the theater community. Mm, yeah, I don't get it. Well, let's break it down. The theater community. You know, directors, actors, stage managers, playwrights, designers, drummers. Okay, yeah, 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 I got it. So, so being an artist can be isolating at times. Mm -hmm. Where do you share your ideas and frustrations and find a connection with other creators? Is that where the common comes in? Is it like the Boston common? Yeah, sort of. Or like common sense. It's shared knowledge for everyone. And you mean everyone, like no exclusive access. You don't require a sacrifice to the HowlRound gods. Uh, no. Hmm. Because when it comes to art, everyone's story matters. Even my coworker Polly, who steals my yogurt every week? Yeah, even Polly is part of the community. Huh, and HowlRound is built on the community. Absolutely, it's driven by the community with user-generated content. So you watching are part of the community. You are HowlRound. Congratulations. Well, now all that's left to do is for you to tell us your story. Check out our participate page or put yourself on the map. Write for the journal. Dream an event on HowlRound TV. Or join us every Thursday for a live theater Twitter chat using hashtag HowlRound. Our team is eagerly waiting to hear from you. Look at those faces, so eager. If you want to get some more details on how to participate, or you already forgot everything we just said, head to hellround.com slash participate. And some more good news, we use social media. God, we're hip. We're on Facebook, we use Storify. You can find us on Twitter at HowlRound and Instagram at HowlRound underscore comments. So make sure you check us out. Roll the credits. How Welcome to HowlRound. You may be wondering. Sorry, I think the only way is to go all the way back there. Oh, okay. Just remember all that we've talked about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you keep it on this one. Okay. So, um, so essentially, what HowlRound is is it's an online community produced by theater mint makers who are committed to advancing um, theater's cultural impact. And so for us, um, I guess another, exa another example of like a commons is um, if you think of like the ocean, that's an environmental commons. It's something that we don't own, but every, individually, but everyone has access to it. Um, and the, another example of a knowledge commons is Wikipedia. Um, it's user generated, people edit um, articles about all different types of subjects and it's free and open to the public. So um, the name of um, HowlRound actually comes from an actual term, which in short we call HowlRound. <laughs> it's an amplified feedback loop. And so for us, um, it's this idea of, how we see HowlRound as a place to share feedback, learning, expertise, and vision. So these are a sh this is a short list of some of the platforms that we have. All of our platforms are open and free. Anyone can participate. Um, something to note is that a lot of our content, the majority of our content is um, we use peer production. So in a sense, we open, which another way term is open sourcing, in which the community finds itself, it, the community itself um, co-creates our platforms. So we have the journal, How Long TV, the new play map, which we're revamping to World Theater Map, convenings, and Twitter discussions. So one of the ways that um, anyone can participate is that they can write for the journal. We um, publish one to three articles per day. Anyone can pitch to us. Um, we also pay all of our contributors. Um, and as a team, we edit all of the all of the journal entries. So, an interesting thing that I think about when I think of our journal is that we have authors who range from students, professors, artists, and practitioners in the field. And so, by having by having this open platform, we're really leveling the playing field in terms, um, especially when you think of um, peer-reviewed journals. There's always like this process. Um, especially within academia, of like what is a reputable journal, 
and like whose voice is mentioned is included. And so we really like to open up the space of like who gets to share their um, experience, their knowledge. So it's out there for everyone to consume. Um, can you go back? Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Um, I think another important thing is that we archive all of our uh, all of our articles, um, and so you can do a simple um, search based on different um, a topic that you're interested in, and we also tag all of our articles. In which, um, so if you're interested in political theater or queer theater or um, immersive theater, you'd be able to. Um, click on um, a tag to see what type of content that we've already published concerning that topic. Um, we also have How Long TV, which um, is free as well. Anyone can live stream. Um, and so we live stream panels from conferences and also performances. And I'll actually be live streaming, streaming segments of um, this conference this weekend. So if you see me, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, an interesting thing about Hello TV is that because it's um, it's free and it's online, we're really able to have a global reach. And so an interesting thing, there there've been quite a few um, events that happened that we live stream um, a while ago. We, um, we live streamed the Belarus, Belarus Free Theaters um, Festival um, back in November. Um, they have a very interesting story, so um, it's it's a lot. <laughs> but um, I definitely recommend like looking that up as well. Um, as I mentioned before, we have um, our current map is the new play map. Um, we're actually revamping it. So what the New Play Map currently does, it focuses on new, the journey of new plays, and um, that focus primarily has been um, in the States. And so we're revamping it to the World Theater Map, in which it's, so it's more, it's more encompassing of like what is actually going on in theater around the world. So it's, it's, it has two parts. It is a um, directory of who's who in theater in terms of directors, playwrights, designers, and also producers of that sort. And it's also going to be a real-time map of theater that's happening across the globe. And this project is currently in development, and we're launching it sometime this summer. Um, next, we um, another platform that we have are our convenings which are in-person gatherings um, dedicated to theater makers and practitioners who are interested in discussing um, current issues within the field um, and proposing ideas of like how they can remedy that situation, those, those issues. Um, one convening, um, what, there was a convening three years ago um, that was centered around Latino theater. Um, and a group of seven Latino theater artists got together and they decided that they didn't want to just meet beyond this, they wanted to meet beyond, they wanted to have a bigger reach than just this single community. And so they formed the Latino Theater Commons, which kind of um, is like almost, it kind of, we've kind of grown, it's, with how long it's kind of grown almost like say hand in hand in terms of maturation. And so this is a photo from, um, one of the Latino theater um, comments. Um, another way to participate is um, moderating a Twitter discussion. Um, so anyone can moderate. <laughs> um, we basically just put out a call on Twitter asking if anyone has any ideas, um, if they want to suggest a topic and or moderate. And, um, yeah, the Twitter discussions are two, um, on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central Time, and 11 a.m. Pacific Time. <laughs> and you use the hashtag HowlRound. Um, just an overview, um, there's several different ways to participate. Um, I would say the easiest way is to follow us and share 
and like us on social media. Um, as the video mentioned, we're on Facebook, um, Storify, Twitter, also we're on Instagram, which is really new. <laughs> um, also, you can write for the journal or read articles from the journal that, in that interest you in particular. Um, you can also live stream for Hollow TV. And something I forgot to mention is you can also watch the TV um, events live or on video on demand. We actually archive those um, videos as well. So um, probably within this coming week, um, there is a TV announcement for um, this particular, it's, this, it's called the NET um, Intersection Symposium. <laughs> so, um, um, go to that announcement and you'll see all of the things that I've either recorded or live streamed throughout the entire um, conference this weekend. And lastly, you can moderate a Twitter discussion. That and snapshot is how we're on today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hi. Well, it's fascinating what I hear, but um, both of them are very important because even if you archive, you know, what do you do with it? You know, people got to see it, people got to be touched and, and educated by it. So I'm uh, basically archiving, uh, to me it started naturally. Uh, 27 years ago when I met a young artist in Los Angeles, uh, I was a, we had a video, a small video company, and when I saw his passion for arts and theater, and when I saw his, you know, new ways of approaching theater, I said, this has got to be filmed, this has got to be filmed. And lucky me that he approved. Not every artist wants to be filmed. Not every actor approves. So <laughs> I was following him everywhere. And, and what happened, I, I worked with him for 10 years. And then after he died, he left a huge legacy. And then we decided to share that with, with, with the world. And so, but if we would not film an archive, you know, his life and work, we would not have this film of, 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 of his life so to inspire other people that we're going to show today. So to me it came naturally and I started going and then I was hired by LA Opera to film everything they do and there was other people and as you know archiving has two uh, 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 sides, I mean two steps. One you have to film but then you have to digitize it or do something with it for the future or show it somewhere. So it was very confusing until to today. Uh, we, we didn't know, okay, what do we do with an analog video? What do we do with a VHS? What do we do with something? Uh, I thought you were going to ask something. Okay, so, um, so what, do we, what do we do? And then DVD came along and we were so happy. It was horrible. The most horrible format you can ever see an SD DVD until Blu-ray. But still, that's not a good archiving uh, you know, thing. So uh, we researched the research and finally came that, you know, uh, either MPEG or um, J uh, most JPEG is the best for the future because we don't know what's happening tomorrow. So uh, anyway, that's set up for now and hopefully gonna stay that way. So everything we film, we can transfer, file it, and keep it to, to different uh, uh, hard drives. So it's, you know, if something happens, it's, it's very sensitive. It can be gone for a second. In a second, it's gone for whatever reason technical, whatever. So that's why I tell everybody, here is the main, make a copy of this um, hard drive and keep it in a different place if you care about your thing. I don't know, you guys are probably have your own way of uh, 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 storing what you filmed and everything. So, so those are the things. But that, what, that what was interesting, I researched archiving a long time ago and they say that the, the French National Archives is the biggest archives in the world because they've been archiving since Napoleon and so on and so on which is probably true. But I think the biggest archive in the world, which we have no access to it, is the Vatican. They have <laughs> everything in the past, and I don't know what they have for the new stuff. But archiving is important, because how do we show the future, that what happened today? And I'm so proud to be part of this archiving. And um, just a couple of things that were there, what happened 15, 16 years ago, uh, Vanessa Redgrave hired me to follow her in Kosovo where she did a huge thing, a big festival. So I said, yeah, it's great. And then suddenly in the middle of everything, she gave up the project. 
She said, well, you know, filming is not important anymore, so do whatever you want to do, but I am not interested in the project anymore. And I said, but, but, but that's crazy. This is, uh, this is so important. I mean, you know, everything is important. And then I said, that's fine. You know, she paid me, everything was fine, it's all. Then I, I, I saw the importance of this event that she did. And I, on my own terms, my own money, my own time, I edited a one-hour uh, documentary. And I tried to show it to her, she didn't want to see it. Other, nobody was interested, I said, okay, forget it, it's up there. 16 years ago, somebody asked me, do you still have any? I said, yes, I have, I have something great. And I haven't seen it for 16 years. And then just last week, they showed it in a big festival, it was standing ovation, because it was a historical piece. It wasn't, um, you know, what happened yesterday. So, oh, oh, I saw my dad, you know, I wasn't even born, and my dad was there, you know, stuff like that. But that's not, that's emotional. But they're also historical and then educational, and this is so important what you do, because how do you reach the migrants? I mean, it's, it's like, there's no way. <laughs> Unless you do what you do, you know. How do you reach the world? And, and, and this is really, really important work. And I, I applaud everyone. And you know, if you have technical questions, I'm pretty good at it. I, I'm reading everything, you know, what you need to archive your footage into the best possible um, future use. Because if you, if, you, if you film it and leave it there, that's going to be outdated. And if you don't digitize it in a proper file, in 10 years, nobody can read it. I don't know. But that's, that's the thing. So I applaud everyone in the panel, and this is a great job. I mean, I, I love what you guys do, and uh, you know, wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Adam has a film across the way across, yeah, in like yeah. 45 minutes. Well, uh, it, 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 this is what archiving is all about. If I wouldn't be inspired, but I didn't do it consciously, I just loved what he did. And then he gave me permission. But if I wouldn't have done that, this, would, this film would not happen. And I hope. If you see the film, this artist who died 25 years ago, um, uh, uh, young, he was only 22, he left behind a, a, a great body of work that any artist can inspire. So I am, I'm right to, you know, if you have time, see it. Yeah. Do, you, do you guys have any questions? We have a couple more minutes before we can wrap it up. comments? <laughs> Okay, maybe we just. Well, I just want to. I do want to say something, which is that <clears throat> you know the idea that I mean you didn't know he was going to die. No. Right. That's so, thank you. That's a good. No, I didn't. It's, it's like you you start um, documenting not knowing the future. No, I didn't. You guys don't know if something's going to be taken out of circulation mm -hmm. or when. You know, there's a certain amount of just going on faith to say this needs to be preserved somehow, but who knows what's going to happen. And now. You know, there's so there's a whole generation of artists that were marked by Rosado, and they don't have any way to explain their artistic heritage except for yours. And, and just to, thank you. And this is small thing. Uh, we showed it in uh, a Portugal, which we got an award. And the young lady, she's she was 24. She's 24. <laughs> she sent an email and she said, "I got your email from the producers, and please, I need to see more of his work." I said, I saw this film, I never, I don't know who he was, but I was very impressed. I want to write a paper on this, this director. I, I was like, this is it, this is what I, my work, I have sent. So I sent her and, and, and gave me an idea. I said, my, my God, we're going to show his work. And by the way, we documented everything he did, every single theater piece. And we put six on the internet right now on his own website. It's on Vimeo. We didn't know how to go by. We put it on Vimeo and we linked on Vimeo. So somebody goes in his website, wants to see a play, he can see the full length play. It's, it's done with the damn camera available. It wasn't digital, it wasn't high definition. But it's pretty good quality. So that thing that this young woman asked me to see more of Reza's work, it, it was the biggest applause I've ever get. And you're right. But also, I think for for a net, you know, for for an ensemble theater focus, um, video documentation is the is you know the text only tells half the, a, a small portion of the story. So even though you know with literary theater, you publish the script and you have it preserved, and then other people will will interpret it. 
with ensemble theater or director driven, you know, creations, yeah. the video is the primary as the primary source for production. And, and to be fair, uh, video cannot invest theater experience. I'm a theater person, I love theater, I love to be that. But video gives you a chance to research, to educate, to see, to, you know, I mean, there's a whole, you know, okay. thing. Is that, I don't think anyone would watch uh, as much for pleasure than for, wow, this is the artist that I, you know, this is, okay, I want to know more about this artist. Yeah. It's still pleasure. <laughs> it still can be pleasure, but it's one dimensional, for God's sake. <laughs> I want big dimensions, you know. Yeah. I guess I have a question. Um, so I guess thinking about taking like a chance on a piece of art that you're going to preserve, how do you think about um, connecting those two communities that you're going to? How do you select which pieces are the ones that you think will resonate with particular communities? Do you mean for the community screenings? Yeah. So I, I know that this piece in particular was um, really profound with connecting to migrant communities. Um, if you were to select another piece, how do you go about figuring out which one you think will be the most effective in different areas? Well, I think I think that um, it's a great question because not all work has. Uh, I mean, a lot of the a lot of what's on the on the board's archive was you know was selected for its kind of contemporary art, um, you know, formal qualities, yeah. not necessarily for its content. And so what we found is that you know um, when when you when, when matchmaking with a non-traditional community who wouldn't necessarily otherwise be interested in kind of that formal exploration, then the content is really key. You know, what does, how does this content speak to a particular person? And then in something like Amarillo, it's, you know, it's beautifully, what, what, what winds up happening is that because the content is rendered in a certain way, um, non-linear, metaphorical, symbolic, multi-sensory, it actually has this interesting effect on non-traditional audiences who are not used to this kind of work, where it opens up a space for conversation. Um, so it's kind of like because it is contemporary work, it is able to have an effect that is a non, you know, that you wouldn't predict. And what one of, anyway, so that's unique about this piece, but we had a lot of conversations about like, okay, well what next, you know? What else is in the, the archive, particularly the, on the board's archive? And I think that, you know, if, if we were, if, if if the community screenings project were like on the Wars TV's like number one program, they might seek out work to film because of its ability to speak to certain communities. Um, at where it is at the moment, we are continuing to evaluate what's in the archive, what's in the kind of archive, and see see what what leaps out at us as something that might have power to to reach um, beyond an art <coughs> art audience. And I would, I would just say also to that, like Ruth is specifically talking about the more pieces that um, even we have or that anyone has, like the, the idea is that you're documenting everything so that you then have a community that is interested in something and then you can connect with that community and what you have, they can choose, right? You have a catalog of films available. So like when we went back to Klamath Falls, they chose a different type of way to connect with a different part of their community, which is part of what we want to do. You know, we want to be the, the catalog, the resource that can provide the content, and they can, and the community can choose the conversation that they want to engage with. Um, and so, there's there's uh, contemporary performance films that, by nature, are have a social political dynamic within the performance itself. And so, the pieces like Anne Mario can speak more directly to that. And then there are pieces that are more artistically focused and you know a more traditional dance or something like that and that might be actually what the organization and community is interested in, in engaging in a dialogue about a different level of artistic quality that they haven't been able to bring before so i think kind of like both sides of that is just it's hard it's hard to say like you have to look for specific things within a piece of work in order to say it's worth filming because you kind of want to have everything available to you when someone comes and asks, do you have that piece that you filmed 16 years ago? And, right. <laughs> right. And also, I'm more just committed to having, right. I mean, the, 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 uh, your objective is about documenting contemporary performance. So mm -hmm. it's like, a, it's about that form. It's not mm -hmm. one form, obviously, but right. about a certain realm of artistic product. And within that, 
those disciplines, you'll find a large range between something mm -hmm. that's purely abstract to something that's more content, you know, timely. Um, so there's the range. But I think I think um, you know, just like any any anything you might present to the public, you always want to find what is the what is the kind of public for whom this is super relevant mm -hmm. or something that really resonates. And for something that's more like traditional dance, it's like, okay, there are lots of dance students who are learning this stuff, and then for them it's going to be electrifying, you know, and so that's what, when you went back to Plymouth um, Falls, that's what, you know, the ability to add value by bringing in an artist in live and in person was magical for these particular students. And so we, we sort of, you know, it really is a question of, Priorities and sort of like, well, you know, what do, what's the question you start out with? Well, this question was, well, if we go back to this art center and say, what is what among our calendar are you interested in? For them, it was like, oh wow, a Pacific Northwest artist who could be in the room, amazing, you know. And so that was the next phase for them. I just want to add something about archiving and the legality of it. Because it's very strange in the United States, mm -hmm. which is not the same in Europe. I don't know how it's in Mexico, but in Europe it's different. Just two days ago, I was supposed to film an amazingly important uh, play, Endgame, by Beckett, mm -hmm. played by the two last remaining Beckett friends, Ellen mm -hmm. Mandel and Barry, I forgot his last name. So, these two guys are playing right now in Los Angeles, and they both wanted me to film because they know that when I film, I feel my way. And I couldn't. They, they denied me, and they used a one camera, which is good, which is very good to have that. Mm -hmm. A one camera, static, you know. Uh, and I asked why. He said, because we don't want to have good sound, we don't want to have good audio, we don't have anything good, so this doesn't get out in the public because it's illegal, because the union, and so on. Mm -hmm. I knew the law that you can, but at least they could have courtesy to, to the actors who asked me mm -hmm. to say, well, if you archive, let, let my friend archive the way he knows how to move the camera. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I lost it. It doesn't matter. It's not about that. It, it's about this important end game that's playing in LA, it's closing Sunday, and it's going to be archived with the one little camera with that sound. Mm -hmm. So the actors are very upset. But this is legality, and I have to respect that. But when you go to Europe, <laughs> there is no... And then he can, if the actors approve, if the house approve, you come with a camera to film and do, you know, to do destruct. Is Mexico has also some kind of... Uh, I think uh, there are not much... Uh, uh, restrictions? Yeah. Restrictions no. on that. I, I thought so, because... So you can agree with the artists. Yeah, the artists, yes. yeah. But in, in a 99 seat theater, I think it's easy. The actors union that makes it... Yeah, the actors union yeah. makes it hard. What is changing now also, yeah. I didn't follow the, the big deal, but it, it's, I don't know, it's sad because uh, it needs to be archived even, and, uh, and the last story I tell you, uh, I don't know, eight years ago, Julie Tamer did this, this her first album, uh, I think it was Brenda or something, it's a big album, and so I was at LA Opera, uh, the videographer, and they let me only 10 minutes. They said, you only film 10 minutes. I said, can I film two minutes, two minutes, one minute, two minutes? <laughs> I said, I don't want to film more 10. Julie needs more than 10 minutes. So that somehow they agree, okay, okay, you can film here and here and here. So I broke the law, but not because of my own profit. If I didn't want to, you know, it wasn't for me. I said, there's no way Julie Tamer cannot use a whole performance for her own. And I did, I filmed the whole thing. And I had a little red button, you know, and put it on. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you know, so at the end, I gave it to uh, the PR people and I said, oh my God, you know, I hope nobody will find out. Just don't worry about it. Two weeks later, Julie Tamer called. Oh, do you have the whole performance? And they said, no. The, the theater said, no. But, you know, call Adam. And maybe he does. They didn't want to have any... And she called me, I gave her the whole thing, she thanked me, she said, oh my god, I have to look every frame because it's her director and she wanted it for uh, making it better. So these are real stories that, you know, I, I don't know what to make out of them. Well, I think, that, that, yeah, there's kind of a, a tension between a kind of more traditional American model of theater where, the, like I said, the, pre the key preservation is in the form of literary publication. And then all the rest is just interpretation. I see. Um, and actors unions are there to kind of protect um, copying of different forms of interpretation. 
so that's kind of you know when you're talking about collective creation or um, you know, director-led visions of a piece the piece what the piece is is not a series of interpretations it is the whole so, scenic yeah, uh, thing and so only video can really do that so it's it's the american model is very stuck in the kind of um more traditional model but the public loses because you know it would be nice to have it available and for a fee i mean it's so nice of you to to charge five dollars but share the fee with um you know with audience mm -hmm. i mean that that's that's going on all the time i mean uh, Louis C.K., the comedian, and he, did you see what he did? He said, forget producers, forget everything. I make my own, I put it on, and I pay so much. I pay $5 and $8 for each episode because I love the way he yeah. does things. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of the probably millions who, who pay for his art, and he splits with the artist. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Eh, y quizá eso um, cambie un poco la idea como heter eh, heterodoxa de la idea de archivo de documento. Maybe this could change the idea, the heterodox, uh, standard, status quo idea of the document. Pero cuando estudias en Cornelius, mm -hmm. la gente llevaba palomitas, mm -hmm. eh, bebida, porque iban a ver una película. When we, were, when we were in this little town of Cornelius for the screening, uh, people were eating uh, popcorn mm -hmm. and because they were ready for a movie time. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> aún que aclaramos que era un documental, o sea, un archivo. Even though we told them that this was an archived performance. Uh -huh. Ellos esperaban ver una historia. They were ready to see a story. Mm -hmm. Sí, creo que lo pasaron bien. Then he thinks they had a great time. Pero quizá podríamos pensar que puede haber una forma más flexible para ciertos públicos. So he thinks maybe there could be a more flexible form for certain audiences. Mm -hmm. In terms of edition? In, in, audio, in, in editing. Mm. Actually, this is for you. Para que la gente coma palomitas y vea una película. He's saying that, he's saying that what, actually, when, when we left the theater, mm -hmm. Jorge was saying, you know, if we had edited this or that mm -hmm. out of it, it could mm -hmm. work, it could succeed more as a film, as a film. in itself mm -hmm. for people to be eating mm -hmm. popcorn mm -hmm. while they watch it, you know, <laughs> rather than just an archive. So right. it does change right. the life of the life of the piece. Okay. Okay. Well, we, have, we have it. They, just, the they don't think, yeah. <laughs> they don't think yeah. in the yeah. idea of an archive. They right. think in the right. terms of, mm -hmm. of film. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, part of our goal right now and at the beginning was to fight. I mean, we launched this. We started the project in 2008, and people were like, oh, you can't replace live performance with film, mm -hmm. which is true, and we acknowledge mm -hmm. that. But also, one of our goals was like, this this is a representation of the live performance, and so we try to make it as realistic as possible. But there is also a lot of footage that we have stored away just in archives that you could go back and make more of a film out of it instead of it being a sort of documentary production, which is a really interesting idea, actually. Yeah. Next grant. Depends <laughs> what the life of it is. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, now are we done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I only really want to say that uh, the, the advantage of filming the theater, uh, I think, is uh, that you can go further, like you can do a, a, an approach, like closer approach mm -hmm. to, to the thing. That, okay, in your, if you are uh, seen at the, uh, the theater, you have this live experience, but you have the distance of the, okay. of the performer, but it's maybe in a frontal way, or, I don't know, whatever. But with film, you can, be closer to the performer, closer to the backstage, maybe. And so that can be a lo uh, another interesting right. point of view from the stage with the film. Mm -hmm. I think it's that that can be a yeah. Well, that makes me think of uh, there's another film on a TV, uh, Kyle Levin's Lost Machine, which is a, a puppet piece, and it was filmed with uh, Alan. Closer and it, it like stands alone as it's more as a film, I think, and less as like a theatrical piece. Is it like or a the, an archive of the, the theatrical production is like it's in and like mm -hmm. 
audience. Yeah. So you can yeah, you can reframe it in a way without the, without an audience. Yeah. I just want to say it's yeah. very interesting that you both brought up this idea of like the intersection mm -hmm. you know, the conference. <laughs> <laughs> the um, theater and film. Like yeah. right. that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can we have a picture together? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, good, good. We have some. Right? Okay. <laughs> thank you. I want to have a nice time with you. Yeah. Oh, it yes. was very lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think we're all here for the rest of the conference. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>